Hi, my name is Christian Hernandez from the Cloud Platforms Business Unit over at Red Hat. Today, I'm going to be talking about managing storage via GitOps. So a little overview of what I'm going to be covering today is um, I'm going to be going over just a general overview of how storage works in Kubernetes. Uh, this is going to be a high level overview, as I expect some of you uh, to already at least know from a high level um, how storage works in Kubernetes. I'm going to go over a GitOps in general, right, to get a little background on that. Um, since this is a GitOps Summit, I expect at least some of you to at least have, have um, the general idea of what GitOps is. Uh, but I'm going to be going over an overview just to kind of level set for everyone. Then I'm going to be going over just some of the challenges of, of how to do GitOps with storage, right? And when I say storage, I mean stateful applications. And I'll go over exactly what I mean um, during this presentation. And last, I'm going to go over some tips that, um, that I've come across with and go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and demo that as well. So um, the Kubernetes storage paradigm. So uh, Kubernetes has a broad spectrum of storage types that you can attach to since Kubernetes is based on Linux and Linux containers. Um, everything that's available for Linux is also actually by extension available to containers running in Kubernetes. Um, some of the options that I show up here are originally done in tree, right? So the in tree code for uh, Kubernetes, things like NFS, iSCSI, um, uh, the VDMKs for VMware, right? Are some of the popular ones, AWS, EBS volumes, uh, et cetera. Um, as that journey progressed, right? And as we've gone down the path of, of storage providers that didn't really scale that well, right? Keeping code in tree. And so um, we've developed, right? In the Kubernetes ecosystem, the container storage interface, right? Or the CSI, which is a common interface on how to interact with storage on Kubernetes. And I think all, if not um, some, if not all, I think now I think we're at, at a position where most of these storage providers are provided by a CSI interface. So whether you're using an entry driver or the CSI interface, the paradigm on how to use storage in Kubernetes stays relatively the same, right? The end user experience stays the same. And that's the idea between uh, PVs, right? Uh, persistent volumes and PVCs, which is the persistent volume claim. So uh, let's kind of go over how the persistent volume claim um, paradigm works, right? So the first is the, the persistent volume uh, consumption model and, um, in general, right? So I have a pod definition here, for example, saying, hey, I have this application and I need some storage. Um, and so here I say, hey, I want to use persistent volume claim Z in, in this example, Z or Z, however you, you like to say it. So this claim here, claim Z, uh, then this what we it's what we call a persistent volume claim. That claim um, gets picked up by a persistent volume, right? So there's a one-to-one -one relationship where a persistent um, volume will satisfy a persistent volume claim. And so persistent um, volume claim is just essentially saying, hey, I need storage with these type of um, parameters, for example. And then the persistent volume says, hey, I have a match for you. Here's your storage. Um, and that, when that actually happens, Right? That's actually uh, abstracted to the end user, not only to the end user, but actually from the admin level as well, um, because those are just definitions. Right, the, the claim is just a definition of what I need, and the persistent volume itself is a definition on how to connect to that volume. So what actually ends up happening is the, um, the node, the actual um, Kubernetes node, will then actually mount that storage and present it to the pod and all the containers in the pod uh, via the container runtime um, as a directory. And so um, all the storage uh, for a pod, it just appears as a directory uh, for the pod in all the containers inside the pod. Um, and then it's mounted in whatever um, you want it to be mounted in. And so, um, and in a way, um, you know, in a, in a static storage provisioning paradigm, we have an admin who predefines a lot of these persistent volumes um, ahead of time, right? So they're seeing like, 
the NFS persistent volume. Here's an NFS persistent volume. Here is how to mount it. Here is the IP address, right, of the NFS server, things like that, and make create iSCSI PVs, you know, with the, um, the iSCSI uh, target information, maybe some login information. Um, and an admin will create all of those ahead of time, right? It will create a pool of storage. Uh, the end, um, so that's the admin's uh, perspective, whereas the end user perspective doesn't really change, right? It, he, the, this, this, the end user just says, hey, I need two gigs of read, write, many storage. Um, and then it'll, it'll be bound. Um, one, one of those storage systems will satisfy, right? The first one that satisfies that, uh, that option um, will be the winner, essentially. And then that will be then mounted on the pod itself. So um, you don't have to do it statically, right? So um, there's a, an option of doing it dynamically, whereas an admin will set up a, what we call a storage class. The storage class essentially originally was intended to tier your storage, right? I say, I want, um, uh, I want, you know, um, gold storage, right? Which is SSD. I want silver, right? Which may be uh, spinning metal, what have you, right? Um, and the storage class is just a definition on how to connect to that storage or how to provision that storage. So the side effect being is that the admin will just set up the storage class and then the admin is hands off from that point where the user will say, hey, I need two gigs of read, write many of pretty good storage. The uh, control play and API will then connect to the storage class. And from the storage class, it would, um, it would know how to create that storage on the back end, right? Whether you're using the entry driver or the CSI driver, doesn't matter. Um, that's all abstracted to you. So then all of that happens automatically, right? I, I ask for some storage. I get some storage via the storage class that was set up by the admin. So the admin doesn't have to maintain a pool of storage. The admin only has to worry about things like um, quotas and um, limits and things like that. So now that we got familiar, very familiar with storage, let's talk about GitOps in general, right? And anytime I talk about GitOps, um, I inevitably have to talk about DevOps, right? So uh, GitOps isn't um, necessarily anything new. It's how DevOps engineers were already doing things, right? It's kind of just like a rebrand or a slight modification of how DevOps is, was doing. And so, um, you know, D DevOps is the idea, it's a culture of everyone working together uh, to meet an objection, right? No more of uh, the idea of, of a siloed ways of doing things. Um, and, you know, the, the DevOps engineers out there, the, the, the number one tool that they use is actually CICD. They live and die by the CICD, much like a lot of developers, a lot of um, SREs and, and DevOps engineers use things like uh, CICD in order to deliver things, deliver their applications and keep them consistent. So, um, so what does GitOps fall into that? So what, so well, what's the, what's the advantages of using GitOps here? So, um, get, GitOps is, is the idea of taking that, that, um, the process that developers have already have been doing for a while and then pushing that up into the application as a whole. So that's kind of using like Git as a source, uh, the single source of truth, right? Everything, since we're doing cloud native, since we're doing Kubernetes, everything is a manifest. We keep everything in Git and use it as a source of truth, right? So that meaning that we treat everything as code, the infrastructure, the application, the way you de deploy it, that's treated everything as code. And one of the other pillars of, of GitOps is that you're doing your operations through Git workflows, meaning um, um, a term that's thrown around a lot is operations through pull requests, right? So like if I need to make a change, I, instead of using SSH, right? So if you think about it, from Kubernetes, we went from using SSH to kubectl, but GitOps are taking it to the next level. Now, not only am I taking away SSH, I'm taking away your kubectl as well. And now you're doing everything through Git workflow. So instead of, you know, we went from, instead of SSH making a change, okay, now we're doing changes with kubectl. No, no, don't do the change with kubectl, make a pull request and allow the GitOps workflows to make that change for you. That's the whole idea behind GitOps. And, um, you know, plugging in GitOps to a Git workflow is essentially, it takes care of that CD part. So remember when I was talking about CI/CD, 
you know, continuous, um, the CI part where you always build, always iterate, making sure that your application, you're trying to um, iterate on your application over and over again. Well, that last mile, that last CD part is where GitOps actually shines, is, um, is a way to keep your desired state and what you currently have in sync. Right. The, uh, GitOps is a way to reconcile those two. So why would you want to use GitOps? It's a standard workflow. Everyone understands it. Even, you know, I've come from an operations background. Even the operation folks uh, understand Git and know how to use Git workflows. And people can be quick, uh, brought quickly up to speed since it's been a uh, standardization of how we do work nowadays is uh, through Git workflows. Um, this gives... Um, Enhanced security, right? So enhanced security and visibility and audit, I would like to glom those two points, even though there's um, together as one point is that everything is visible, everything is auditable and, um, and everything can be, can have um, uh, a change uh, control on it, right? So if someone makes a pull request, you know, you have a protected branch so they can't uh, commit directly or can't do a force commit, they have code review, you have your security guys being able to look at it, right? There's a whole process before that PR gets merged. But as soon as that PR gets merged, it automatically gets applied to your clusters. So, um, and that's like the last point of getting multi-cluster consistency across multiple clusters, right? As soon as that PR hits, it gets applied to all your clusters. So, um, so the GitOps application delivery model from a high level seems very familiar if you're already doing things in Kubernetes, um, or already doing things with pipeline, um, you know, you have your CI process that builds an image, uh, changes some config, and then uh, either pushes or pulls it to Kubernetes. But the, 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 the power in GitOps is this little CD part, right? So instead of it being a, an event-driven model where um, something triggers that, um, that, that deployment, right, is something that, that's keep on running, right? So we, we leverage what Kubernetes, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes always has a um, control loop that's constantly running. We take that same idea and kind of move it up to the application level, right? There's something that's always monitoring. There's always, always detecting the drift. They'll take action if it needs to, right? Reconcile and deploy an application if it needs to. So, um, so that's the, the real power behind uh, GitOps. So, so now some of the challenges, right? So I'd like to take a little bit of uh, opportunity to talk about some of the, um, one of the biggest advantages of, of, of GitOps is that if for whatever reason you lose your cluster, right, disaster happens. Um, AWS region goes down, someone accidentally runs a Terraform script and deletes uh, an entire cluster. Um, the idea of GitOps, since everything is in Git, it is a source of truth. So you DevOps engineers and you SREs, you're like, you're, you've already known this for a while. So, well, since everything's in Git, all I need to do is install that agent, right? Just bring up a cluster, install that agent, right? Whether it be Argo CD, whether it be a Flux, um, what have you. I bring up that agent and I just point it to my Git repo and everything gets synced up, right? Everything is perfect. Everything is perfect if you're only doing stateless applications. So the real problem is, and it's a problem... Um, that I don't think anyone has really solved yet is um, the problems your data. The problem is stateful applications. That is um, one of the, the biggest things and one of the biggest challenges in GitOps is just some of the challenges we've always been facing in terms of DevOps. So um, uh, challenges to the GitOps world in terms of storage, right? So um, dynamic storage provisioning by default has a reclaim policy set to delete. So when, when, when you... Um, when you, when you claim a, a when, you, when you set up a dynamic storage and you use that, the reclaim policy set to delete, meaning that if someone deletes the PVC definition, the PV gets deleted. Oh, and not only the PV definition gets deleted, the backend storage gets deleted. Um, and you know that's that's the problem of full automation versus full control, right? Like it's not like you don't have any control. You have some control, but you know, in automation, you're giving up some control for some automation. You don't really have a lot of control in terms of uh, when, when you're doing dynamic storage. So, um, and reclaiming storage after disaster is a manual process with dynamic storage, right? So it's, it's, it's basically, you know, uh, set up a dynamic storage, grab the backup from somewhere, S3 bucket, tape drive, whatever, 
and then you have to re re um uh um you know restore that so I'm, I'm thinking in terms of a database right so in database you know restoring from a backup from a database me being from operations i'll tell you right now devops engineers developers it's the last thing we want to do um and me especially from the operations that's i would much rather attach a disk and let the database recover itself because um some of you may know maybe not all of you um you know databases are actually pretty good at recovering themselves um they have all that built in they have though decades of um of experience recovering itself and all that work has already been done so me as administrator it's actually a less work for me to re reattach um uh reattach your disk and then you know maybe if i lost a few tables a few records here then i can maybe restore those rows specifically from a backup but i much rather not deal with massively restoring my storage system so um then there's the case of manual storage provisioning so um the the drawback to that doing it everything manually right instead of using dynamic storage you're using manual storage is that the storage needs to be set up for each application so every time someone wants to deploy a new application that needs storage it needs to go through some process um, in order to get that um get that set up right in GitOps, it's a little easier because it's nothing but a pull request but the backend storage still does need to be provisioned um keeping track of where's where is a little bit a little bit more difficult right i wouldn't say it's it's um hard by any means of it, but it's you know a little bit more work right it's not too laborious but you do need to put that work in to keep track of what is attached to what again if it's in get it's a little easier um and more control means more steps so you know that's the the idea i was i was kind of alluding to a little bit you know you have full automation with dynamic storage not so much control manual storage you have a lot of control not so much automation so um you know there's these things that you need to keep keep in mind um and other things to consider, right? Um, if is file permissions, right? This is especially true for uh, for like databases where, um, you know, when you when you run a container, and this is especially true in uh, in OpenShift, right? Uh, using OpenShift um, Kubernetes platform, is um, it runs as a random UID, so. You know, when I spin up and try to um, attach old storage, it is going to have a different UID to it, and so I need to keep that in mind, right? So you have to uh, thinking about um, uh, file permissions and things like that, making sure that those permissions are set um, properly. So, um, and then restore from backups. So um, that leads, I guess, to my final point: is that there's really no magic bullet. Um, you're going to use a combination of things. You're not going to um, use one thing over another. You're gonna, you, you know, you're you're gonna have to play around with it to yourself. Um, I don't think we solved this problem just yet. Um, I do have some things that I do in in my environment that help mitigate this a little bit to making sure that when I restore my application, there's little little to no work on making sure all these um, the the storage back in for my stateful applications uh, needs to be massaged. Maybe a little massage, but not too much. Um, so um, let's, I'm going to go through a little quick demo on, um, uh, on, on what I do to kind of try to mitigate some of the, some of the challenges that you've come across. And so uh, I have a Kubernetes cluster here. Um, uh, this is an OpenShift Kubernetes cluster, right? It ha I have Argo CD installed, right? When I, um, you know, open this here up, it'll take me to Argo. And I have an application deployed on Argo CD because uh, application is a uh, sample CRUD application. As you see here, if I go to the, the YAML, uh, this is the YAML that it's deploying for this application, right? So it's a simple um, front end with a database two tier application. So I have, um, I'm not gonna go through all this YAML, right? All this is just standard Kubernetes uh, YAML. One thing I do want to call out um, that I do specifically is one is my PV. So let's look at my persistent volume definition. So um, I don't use a storage class. So I'm actually using, um, uh, I'm not using dynamic storage provisioning. I'm going to attach directly to an NFS file system. Um, so here I set my reclaim policy to retain, meaning that if this, if the PV definition gets deleted by accident, 
it's fine. It's only the definition. The data in my storage system stays there. It gets retained. Um, I also have a claim ref, right? So my claim reference, meaning that uh, only this um, persistent volume claim that is, that is named this way can take, can use this storage. Oh, and from this namespace, right? So I'm trying to, um, trying to limit uh, who can attach this. And then also I have a specific label called priceless storage equals yes. Um, and then that's the persistent volume itself. So on the claim itself, I have, um, again, I'm not on the claim. I say it as, as, as the, the claim side, I'm not gonna use a storage class. So no zero storage class. Um, I'm gonna connect to it directly. Um, I'm gonna have this label selector. Oh, sorry, it's down here. This label selector, price of storage equals yes. And then I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm naming it and having it in the proper directory, right? So what I'm doing is I'm creating a one-to-one -one mapping of my storage and my uh, persistent volume claim. Um, and, you know, so that way it's all the way through. That way I know I'm using this specific storage on the back end. And then, so if I take a look at my application, so here's my application to make this a little bigger. Um, I have a simple CRUD application. If I uh, drop down to a CLI, um, if I do uh, GIF pods, I could do um, execute, uh, where's my database? There it is. So if I do select star from products, I believe it is. Yes. So I have, um, just to let you know, I have two, um, two records, right? So there's no funny business here. If I create a record, let's create a record. Um, well, since I have them behind me here, I'll do a guitar, right? I'm going to sell a guitar. Um, you know, this is priceless, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll set up a big price. I'll put this under miscellaneous, right? Read records. Um, let's go back. Right. So then a guitar is there now, right? It wasn't there before. Now it's there. So I'm actually writing to this database. Let's take a look around here. I have, um, right. I have, uh, let's get this here. So I have this persistent volume, right? I have reclaim policy retained and it's bound to that claim. If I get uh, the claim there, right? So you see that it's that matching here. So let's, and this corresponds to um, a storage system back here. So let's, um, let's look at the storage system. This NFS server has um, permissions uh, to this group ID 555. So why does that matter? So let's go back to my deployment. So let's look at the database deployment. In the database deployment, I am running as extra user supplemental group 555, right? 5555. So this, when this container runs, it'll actually run as this group. So let's go back. Yeah, so then let's, let's look over here and let's simulate a failure, right? So let's go, um, oops, that is the wrong screen, sorry. All right, simulating a failure. I'm deleting the whole namespace, right? This is progressing. Um, it's starting to read out of sync, right? Your alarms are going off. If you have alerts, pager duty goes off, all that fun stuff. Um, so I, I deleted all this namespace, but since um, if I do get PVC, there's nothing here. Um, if I do get PV, it's still there. Um, so let's delete that because we're simulating a failure, right? Total failure, the cluster's deleted, um, all that fun stuff. Since I had the claim policy as retain, I still have all my data on the backend NFS server. So that's, that's good. Um, so now um, let's pretend that I recreated the cluster. I installed Argo CD. I defined the application. And remember, I'm pointing to this uh, Git repo. So let's sync it. So here, um, certain things are getting created. 
let's see how so the namespace got created and pretty soon the pv got created right so let's just go back to get pv ah it's back right so the, the it's back it's bound pvc is there right and my storage is there so so what ends up happening is that um when i sync this since I've specified the backend storage explicitly in my YAML repo in a GitOps fashion, um, I set up the supplemental group. So I make sure my permissioning permissions were all right. I set, um, make sure my PV and PVC were mapped to where they could only be mapped to each other one-to-one. -one. Um, and I have, you know, that definition of the NFS and in, in the NFS, I made sure that, that uh, those permissionings were there. So um, the, the expected permissions were there. And so um, when I reload this page, right, I have um, my application still there. There we go. Applications there is up and running. And if I go back to, um, if I do uh, exec of the database. And you can see that um, my entry is there. And if I do a DF here, um, inside the container, as you can see, I am uh, mounted here. With the right permissions. And this container is also running as group 55555. So um, as you can see, you know, um, this doesn't take take the place of doing backups or anything. This is, you know, I'm still going to be doing backups. I'm still be doing SQL backups. I'm still going to be doing backups of my uh, database, um, database back in NFS storage. But as you can see here in a GitOps way, um, if I plan ahead, I can get that, um, that um, um, in a GitOps fashion, the, uh, a way to restore uh, from a catastrophic failure. Um, with minimal need for me to do um, restore from backup. Um, so, you know, in a, in a real production environment, I may have to massage this a little bit, um, but in the end, um, you know, I'm, I'm mitigating that from a little bit. So I hope you enjoy this presentation um, and I invite you to um, um, connect with me on social media. If you have any questions, my, uh, it's Christian H814 at Twitter. And uh, thank you for watching. Um, thank you for watching the presentation, and, um, and I apologize for the, the technical difficulties. Um, the uh, the presentation was posted, right? It's on it's on Sketch, so you can get that aware. And, and people have been posting it on the chat, so um, you can take a look at those there. Um, so I'm here to answer I'm here to answer a few questions, right? If you guys can stick around for for a couple minutes, um, there is a question that just came by here uh, from Adam, right? So it says. Adam says, so if I understand, we need to have a one-to-one -one PV to PVC boundings, right? So the, um, so the answer is yes. So what I found in my best practices, um, what I've been testing, is that having a one-to-one -one, um, makes it easier for recovery, um, especially for things like for your stateful applications, right? So if you have stateful applications like databases or anything else that needs uh, to hold state, um, the, the biggest problem, the biggest issue is always permissions. It's just, it's just what I've, you know, and if, if you're running, um, open shift, everything runs as a random user ID. So it's a little difficult to predict. Um, and, you know, but there's ways to do things like I did have a supplemental group, um, create a specific a service account with a specific range of, uh, user IDs to mitigate some of those issues. So, um, if you're running a stateful workload, I highly recommend having a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, so that way you, you know what belongs to what and fix any permissions that you may have. Um, so uh, question, next question that came up here is this, would this work the same with any storage backend NFS, for example, with Rook, Ceph, storage? Yes. So the answer is yes. Um, the, uh, again, like I explained before, um, the biggest problem isn't necessarily the kind of storage you're using, but things like permissions, right? Permissions is, is essentially the, the biggest issue that I've, I've come across. Um, um, I've, I've done a few tests 
and um, with even with dynamic storage, right? Since um, user IDs is always like the biggest problem. That's the biggest issue that I've run with. So it's really um, the um, the idea of having um, the permissioning, either whether it be like you set the permissions yourself or in, in Argo CD, um, you have the idea of pre-sync hooks and post-sync hooks, right? So you can have something that happens as, as a pre-sync. It could be something like checking the permissions and fixing those permissions. But the idea is um, is uh, pay attention to the permissions and how your application, how your workload runs. Uh, next question here, I see, do you have any suggestions to get started to learn experiment with PV, PVC? Yeah, so there's a lot of um, resources out there. Um, you know, us being from Red Hat, you can go to uh, kubernetesbyexample.com is a great place to start. There's also uh, learn.openshift.com. It kind of takes you through, you know, probably from zero, you know, to containers, to Kubernetes, and then on to OpenShift. And um, there's a lot of free resources there. So I uh, recommend um, looking at that, those things. I also like, um, uh, VMware also has the uh, uh, TGIK, which is great. I watched that as well. A lot of good stuff there. So uh, this is a great question. Um, um, Rachel, I, I, I see that. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll actually type it in the chat as well when I'm done here. So next question is, um, if you have a stateful app, like a database, is it better to restore the database using specific tooling for the app or just restore the PV from backup? For example, perform our bus grace backup and restore. Yeah, so this, um, so this question actually comes up back a lot. Um, I briefly mentioned it in the uh, presentation, but I'll expand on it here a little bit is um, as, as an admin, like, so like as me, as, as a, from coming from an operations background, working with database administrators, we would rather um, attach storage and let the database recover itself. So actually databases are really, really good. Um, 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 it's really, really good um, at restoring itself, right? So the database has that technology built in, right? Um, to restore itself, it's just even, especially Postgres, I have a, a background in Postgres. Um, it um, it has the uh, uh, the ability to back up itself, right? That's step one, right? So as an administrator, we would rather the database just kind of just restore itself because it's really good at that. Uh, step two is actually uh, restore from backup, right? So essentially is attach the disk, um, you know, brand new disk, install Postgres, and then, you know, you know, restore from a, a SQL dump. Um, the only um, problem with that, right, or a challenge with that is that whatever you haven't backed up, you lost whatever that isn't there. So that's why we prefer to do a backup, uh, basically restore the disk, essentially. However that happens, right, whether that's from a snapshot, whether that's from, um, you know, um, uh, you did a, a disk clone somewhere. We'd rather have that and then replace individual tables. So um, it all depends, again. So sorry if that is, isn't a complete answer because uh, it'll depend on whatever. But I, 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 I would rather restore the storage and see if I can get that backup first. And then I would then start thinking about backups and things like that, restoring tables. So yeah, the correct answer is always depends, right? It it's always depends. Um, thank you, Jeff. Definitely, yeah. It it, it always depends on uh, how the failure happened. Sometimes all you have is backup, right? It, you have total failure, and all you have is the tape. So uh, sometimes that's your only choice. Uh, I'm being cognizant of time. Uh, give it maybe like another minute or so uh, for questions. Um, I will be hanging out as well um, in the chat, right? And so. Um, in, in the event chat. So if anyone wants to uh, hit me up there afterwards. Um, that's right. Okay, uh, cool. So I'll be in cognizant of time, right? Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I know it's, we all have uh, uh, digital fatigue, right? So I do appreciate all of you watching and, and, and participating. And yeah, enjoy your lunch, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>